Amen. We love you, brother. We're glad you're here. Very excited. So, um, okay, we're going to open our Bibles this morning over to, we're going to start in Romans chapter number 8. And give me just a moment here while we open our Bibles. Let me erase some things on the board and put something else up there. Okay, that's, that's the title this, this morning, The Cross of Christ, Good News or Bad News? What's the answer, by the way? It depends. That's it, right there. What'd you say, Barry? And then what'd you say, Henry? It said it depends. And you go, what? How could it depend? What are you talking about? Okay. I do want you to open your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter number 8, and this is in connection not just with the message but with the song that we just sang, okay? It's actually Romans 5, I'm sorry, Romans chapter number 5. Everyone here, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, Romans 5 and verse 8. This is a passage that we've, uh, of course, uh, we rejoice together in. So what we're going to do is we're going to read this specific verse out loud together, and then we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll get ourselves going this morning. So Romans chapter 5, verse 8, and it says this, but God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let's ask the Lord to help us as we study his word. Our gracious God and Father, we, we do need your help always when we come to your word, so that we are ever so careful not to superimpose our own viewpoint on your word, but instead to be students, to let your word always be the teacher and us to keep our, our, our hearts and our minds open to learn, open to understand, open to change our thinking if necessary, and it is always necessary. Because, Father, when we approach your word, again, it's, it's your eternal word, and we are so finite and so limited in, really, in our thinking sometimes. So, Father, help us to expand our thinking by allowing your word to teach us. In Christ's name we ask this. Amen. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 is, of course, one of the greatest passages that, we all, passages that we all certainly rejoice in, not only coming to understand our salvation, but now as believers to continue to rest in the fact of uh, the fact that God loves us. He loves us in Christ. And what is the eternal evidence of God's love for us? What's it say in that verse right there? How do you know God loves you for sure? That's right. See that verse? But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet what? Sinners. Sinners, Christ died for us. Now, two weeks ago, I asked a question during the second service about the gospel of the kingdom and whether or not when the disciples were out preaching the gospel of the kingdom, were they also preaching God commended his love towards us in that way we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Were they preaching that in order to be saved and enter into the kingdom, that they had to trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for their salvation? Now, the way that I asked it, and I think in the setting and the context in which I asked it, I could see how it was kind of confusing, and hence I got a confused answer, okay? <laughs> some said yes, some said no. And some later admitted that they were just kind of, since we were eating, they were eating and just shaking their head. Yeah, yeah, whatever the preacher says. No, no, don't ever do that, okay? But it made me realize that we need to go back and review some of these things. So that's what we're doing. So we started this last week, and we're going to take a couple of weeks to look at this because the goal of this is to make sure that we have a real clear picture of the gospel, but when I say the gospel, what gospel? That's right, because in the Bible, there's more than one gospel. That statement right there will come to a shock, as a shock to people. When you say, I mean, I'm talking about preachers. You said, you know that there's more than one gospel in the Bible? They'll say, what? No way. Well, of course there's more than one gospel in the Bible. Noah was never told to trust in the death, burial, and the resurrection of the coming Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, for your justification. Noah wasn't said any, told anything about that. Yet, was Noah given good news? 
What was, what was the bad news in Noah's day? Hey, you know what? Your fishing pole's not going to work with this water that's coming. <laughs> that's, that's a fisherman joke, right? Okay. <laughs> of all the things that Noah was told to carry, he didn't have to carry a fishing pole, right? The bad news was Noah, things are going to get really bad. I mean, really bad, okay? <laughs> what was the good news to Noah? Build an ark. Build an ark. Trust me, Noah. Build an ark. Follow the details. And, I'll, and, and you get in the ark, and I'll put you in. I'll bring all the animals, and I'll put all you guys in, and I'll seal you in that thing, and it'll get you through. That was the good news to Noah. So the gospel of Noah's day had nothing to do with the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Noah wasn't told that. But Noah was told the gospel. Similar with Abraham. And we talked very briefly about this, I believe, that Abraham wasn't told a thing about that the Messiah is going to come one day. He's going to die on the cross for your sins, be buried and raised again from the dead. The concept, the idea that the Old Testament saints were looking forward in faith to the death and resurrection of the Messiah, that, that's, that's actually not true. What did Abraham believe? Remember? God took him up and he said, tell the stars, count them if you can. Tell me the number of them so shall thy seed be. And what did Abraham do? He believed God. And right then and right there, it was imputed to him for righteousness. So what was the gospel to Abraham? It wasn't trust that Christ is going to go die for your sins and be buried and raised again out somewhere in the future. It was trust God's word that he would make your seed as many as the stars of heaven. See that? So... Those are two different Gospels from themselves, and both of those are different than the Gospel of the Kingdom and the Gospel of the Grace of God. So the idea that there's only one Gospel in the Bible is, is just not true. Now, to be sure, in the dispensation of the grace of God... Okay, Ken, I'll open the chart, right? There we go. Because yeah. that's where we live historically. We live in the dispensation of the grace of God. We are not Israel living back here under the law. We're not going through the wilderness. We're not living in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That is not, listen very carefully to what I'm going to say. The information in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is not the doctrine that is to the believer today living in the dispensation of grace. It, it just isn't. That's, that's not belittling Jesus. It's not saying throw Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John out of your Bible. It's just recognizing the word of God about the divided. Who's talking? Who's talking to who? What are they talking about? What's the setting? We're not Israel in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John being prepared to go through the tribulation period. The parables are not about us. We're not in Matthew 24. We're not looking for the second coming of Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation period. God's doing something different today in the dispensation of grace. He's forming the church, the body of Christ. And to be sure, during the dispensation of grace, there is only one gospel that God will use to save anyone. That's a true statement. And so sometimes when we say, well, there's more than one gospel in the Bible, what people sometimes think we're saying is that there's more than one way to be saved during the dispensation of grace. And we're certainly not saying that. Any, any questions on that so far? Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go with me to Mark chapter number 9. Let's just read some verses here. Go to Mark chapter number 9. Look over to Mark chapter number 9. Look at Mark chapter number 9. I'll tell you what, I want you to do something before this. Before you go to Mark 9, get Luke 9. Because Luke chapter 9, the events there happened prior in time to where we're going to read in Mark 9. Okay? So go to Luke chapter number 9. Luke chapter number 9. Look at Luke chapter number 9, verse. I'm going to start at verse 1. 
Look over to uh, Luke 9, verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now notice it very clearly says he sent them to preach what? The kingdom of God. And obviously accompanied by healing. Jump ahead, if you would, to verse 6. And they departed and went through the towns preaching, what does it say there? It says preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Okay, so in our context, what gospel are they preaching? And how do you know? The answer is the gospel of the kingdom, how do you know? Well, look back at verse 2. He sent them to preach what? The kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Verse 6, and they parted and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing the sick. See the connection? So to preach the kingdom of God was to preach the gospel, the connection with healing the sick. So were they already at this point, by this point maybe I should say, are they preaching the gospel of the kingdom? Is there any doubt about that at all? Okay, so now what I want you to do is this. Now I want you to go to Mark 9. Go to Mark chapter number 9. We'll come back to Luke in a little bit here. Look over to Mark chapter number 9. Mark chapter number 9. Look at verse 9. I'll tell you what, go back to verse 2. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, leadeth them up into an high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. So this is, this is going to be the parallel with the passage in Matthew 17, the Mount of Transfiguration. He's transfigured. Jump down to verse 9. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen. Till the Son of Man were what? Risen from the dead. Was the fact of Christ rising from the dead, was that going to be kind of important? Yeah, like where were the top important? Was it something that was prophesied? Was the resurrection, let me ask this, was the death of Christ prophesied in the Old Testament? Yes. Was the resurrection of Christ therefore prophesied in the Old Testament? Yes. Absolutely. So both his death and resurrection clearly prophesied, okay? So when Christ says, uh, tell the vision, he says, uh, tell the Son of Man to be risen from the dead, it's clear that this is going to be important for their program. But watch verse 10 now. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. Okay, now how should we read that phrase? When it said they kept it within themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead should mean. Are they questioning it in this sense, saying, wow, man, it's going to mean this. It's going to mean this. It's going to mean this wonderful thing. It's going to mean eternal life. It's going to mean forgiveness of sins. It's going to be... Re is that the sense? Or is it the sense of, what is he talking about? What, what's this rising from the dead stuff? He's the Messiah. He's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to sit on the throne. He's going to wear a crown of gold, as it were. That's the sense. When that verse says, questioning what the rising from the dead means, not in the sense of, Looking forward to it. Not in the sense of trusting it. Not in the sense of preaching it. Not in the sense of expecting it to happen. Wanting it to happen. You see the difference there? Go back with me to Matthew 16. Go to Matthew 16. Now what we're going to read in Matthew 16, of course, is be right before the transfiguration. So this happens before that statement in Mark where it said they question one with another what the rising from the dead should mean, right? Look at Matthew 16. Now this time verse 21. 1621. 1621, it says this. It says, from that time forth, what now? began Jesus to show unto his disciples 
how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. So there's his death. And be raised again the third day. There's his resurrection. Now, the first part of verse 21, what's significant about that? From that time forth began Jesus. That means... And by the way, when you're in Matthew 16, you're, this is not at the beginning of the ministry of Christ. It's not right at the end either, but it's way past the middle point. It's well past the middle point. And based on the passage in Luke 9 that we read, they're already out preaching the gospel of the kingdom for at least a year and a half, maybe up to two years. Yes? So when Christ, it said, that verse says, then began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem, he's going to be killed and, and raised again the third day. What, therefore, can we conclude that as they were out preaching the gospel of the kingdom, that they were not declaring? Does, does that make sense? When they were out preaching the gospel of the kingdom, were they telling people, our Messiah is here, he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to die for your sins, be buried, and he's going to be raised again the third day, and if you'll believe him, that's how he'll become part of the little flock. Is that what they were preaching? The answer is no. <laughs> I mean, could we make it more clear? I could say no louder, but that isn't Okay. Not only that, that verse says then Jesus began to show. What happens in the very next verse? Look at that verse, 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Imagine rebuking the Lord. <laughs> wow, of course people do it quite often. Did you know that? <laughs> they say, it says, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. When Christ does begin to tell them that he is going to go and die and rise again, they, what does Peter say? Not so. He, not so, Lord. In fact, later on, much, much later on, the night just before he's going to go and, and die and so forth, Peter says, Lord, I, I'll, I'll die with you. I'll give my life to prevent you from being taken. Right? When, when Peter took that sword and cut the guy's ear off, as it were, Christ, you understand, Peter was engaged, as they say. He wasn't a bystander. He wasn't sitting in the cheap seats. He was in the gladiator's ring, as it were. He drew the sword. He starts hacking away. Peter meant what he said, that he was willing to die for the Lord. He was going to stand in the way and prevent them from taking the Lord. It's clear then that as they are out preaching the gospel of the kingdom, they're not telling people, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. They're not preaching to people, Christ died for your sins according to scriptures. Or, or, or they, they wouldn't be able to say that anyway. They would have to say Christ is going to die for your sins according to scriptures, be buried and raised again the third day. And if you'll believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Are they preaching that? No. They're not preaching that. When I say that, I'm not finding fault with them. You understand that? I'm not putting them on the spot in that sense. I'm saying the scripture makes it very, very clear, therefore, that the gospel of the kingdom, as they're preaching it at that time, clearly, therefore, is not the same gospel as the gospel of the grace of God. They're not the same gospel. They're not the same news that is good. Whether it's the gospel of the kingdom or the gospel of the grace of God, where did they both originate from? God. They both originated from God. Both are news that's good. Both have gospel in them, right? So they both came from God. They both have news that's good. But the details of the news 
that was being preached, it's just not the same. That doesn't mean to find fault with one or the other. It just is what it is. And it is to make it very clear that the gospel of the kingdom is not the same thing as the gospel of the grace of God. Let's say that we were living back there in the days of when Christ walked the earth. And whether we were Jewish or Gentiles. Let's say that Peter came knocking on our door. Which, by the way, if we were Gentiles, he wouldn't have come knocking on our door. You guys all know that, right? Because Christ said, don't go to the Samaritans. Don't go to the Gentiles. So they would not have gone. So let me change my what if. Okay. Let's say we were Jews. Okay, back then. Israelites. And Peter came knocking on our door. And he said, hey, I got some good news for you here. Well, what's your news that's good? He says, it's the gospel of the kingdom. What specifically would he have said? Would he have said, hey, our Messiah is here. He's going to be rejected by us as a nation. He's going to go die on the cross for our sins. Three days later, he's going to rise from the dead. And if you believe him, that's how you become part of the believing remnant. Is that what the gospel? That's not at all what he would have said. So what was the good news of the kingdom? You, I, I think I almost said correct. It was the whole, okay. okay. That, yes. The news of the kingdom that was good is that the kingdom was what? At hand. It was at hand. Listen, way back here in the days of the prophets, God through the prophets, he, he said it kind of this way. He said, there's going to come a day out there when I'm going to set up a literal physical kingdom on this planet. Think Daniel chapter number 2. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel 9. And all the prophets, they added more information and more information more information about God's intention and purpose to establish a literal, actual, real, physical kingdom on this planet centered over in Jerusalem with the Son of God reigning as King of Kings and Lord of Lords on this planet, physically, literally, really. An actual, real, physical kingdom. Every bit as real as the kingdom reigned in the days of Solomon. In fact, more real because much greater. Every bit as real as a literal kingdom as the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar and the kingdom of Media, Persia, and Greece, and so forth. Every bit is real. So much so his, his uh, yeah, that, that door is kind of keeps slamming, doesn't it? Thank you, okay. Um, that's the moving of the spirit. How do you like that? Okay. <laughs> anyway. I mean, doesn't the verse say, the wind bloweth where it listeth, right? That's a terrible verse. Don't take that verse out of context, right? So, at any rate, God confirmed his intention to set up that literal physical kingdom on the earth, so much so that he gave him a time schedule, a detailed time schedule, Daniel chapter number nine. And everything he did, he told them when to start counting to the days into which Messiah would show up, the Messiah, the prince. He gave him an exact time schedule. Daniel chapter number 9. Now go with me, if you would, to Mark. Uh, I want you to just, I want you to go to get Mark chapter number 1. And then before we look at the passage in Mark 1, we're going to go to Luke 18. Or the Luke 18. This, we're going to read the one in Luke 18 before we read the one in Mark 1. So, now you should be in Luke 18. Look at verse 31, Luke 18. And when you're in Luke 18, again, you're, you're, you're pretty late in the ministry of Christ. You're down to about the, last, about the last week of his life before he's on the cross, when, you, when you're over in Luke 18, late, uh, late in Luke 18. Look at verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated and spitted on, and they shall scourge him, and put him to death. So there's his death, correct? Correct. And the third day, he shall do what? Shall rise again. Okay, before we read the next verse, 
Did you notice at the end of verse 31 where he says, all things that are written by the prophets? That means everything he identifies that is going to ha happen to him in verse 31, 30, uh, I'm sorry, 32 and 33, that's all in the prophets. They were going to reject him. They were going to kill him. And he was going to rise. But look at verse 34 very carefully. What does it say there? See that? They understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. It, it's very clear then that as they are out preaching the gospel of the kingdom, which they had been doing almost three full years by this point, okay, they were not going out as they're passing out tracts, as they're sending out text messages. They're not saying Christ is going to go die on the cross according to the scriptures for your sins, He's going to be buried and raised again the third day for your salvation. If you'll believe in Christ as your Messiah is going to do that for you, then that's how you become part of the little flock. Is that what they're saying? No. That, that's not what they're saying. So were they preaching the gospel of the grace of God? No. The answer is no. Were they wrong for preaching what they were preaching? No, no not at all. What therefore is... The gospel of the kingdom. If the gospel of the kingdom did not include at its heart them preaching that Christ is going to go die for their sins, be buried and raised again the third day, because it didn't include that. Now, from God's perspective, he knew Christ was going to die and rise again, right? He knew that from before the foundation of the world. So. But if it didn't include that, what exactly was the gospel of the kingdom? Now go to Mark 1. Yeah, the kingdom's at hand. That's good news. Look, look over to Mark chapter number one. Look over to Mark chapter number one. Look over to Mark chapter number one. Watch this, verse 14. Mark chapter number one, verse 14, it says this. Now after that John was put in prison, by the way, that little phrase there will help you be able to interlace, as it were, events in Matthew and Mark and Luke in relationship to one another. Okay, so what, for example, when in Mark 1.14, John is imprisoned by that point, 13 verses into the book of Mark, but how about you go read the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Matthew, you've got a multitude of chapters before John's ever put in prison. So that just helps you in terms of how to lay out sequences that are happening. At any rate, it says, now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, saying what? Quote, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. What gospel? The gospel of the kingdom, which was what? The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So I got a question for you. When they were going out knocking on doors, when they were handing out tracts at the local mall or the train station, what did the tracts say? What did they say? They said, repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That promised, prophesied, foretold, literal, physical kingdom that God said to the prophets he intended to set up and he gave us a time schedule, guess what? It has entered a new phase. What phase? The at hand phase. Listen, back there in the Old Testament, the kingdom wasn't at hand yet. It was coming. It was coming. It was coming. But when you open up Matthew, you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John the Baptist himself starts off, repent. Why? He doesn't say repent because you're a bunch of sinners. He says, repent, why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's, that's Matthew chapter number three. Matthew chapter number four, the Lord Jesus Christ himself sent the disciples out doing the same thing, teaching them to preach, repent, why? 
for the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Matthew chapter 10 as well. When you're reading the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everything that was happening, everything that he did, everything that he said, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, everything, it was happening. Why? Because the kingdom was then at hand. When you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the theme of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is what? It's repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Understand that? Question. Is the kingdom at hand today? No. It's not at hand today. There's been a major change in dispensation. Yes? It would be wrong today to go out and preach the gospel of the kingdom. Fundamentally because the kingdom of heaven is not at hand today. And the gospel of the kingdom is not the gospel of the grace of God. So if we're out preaching to people, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And if that's what we're telling people why they should repent, are we telling them the truth? Do you realize the impact of how you just answered that? Do you realize what we just said? Because isn't there a lot of preaching that is telling people the reason they need to repent is because the kingdom of heaven is at hand? That's what they quote. That's not the gospel today in the dispensation of the grace of God. Back to the question, what therefore is the gospel of the kingdom? It's the good news that the God of heaven who promised through the prophets that he would set up a literal, physical, actual, real kingdom on this earth and he gave them a time schedule in which he intended to accomplish that. In that time schedule, he told them when he would send the Messiah and hence the Messiah showed up. The Messiah showed up saying the time is fulfilled. The gospel of the kingdom was that the kingdom of heaven had really entered the at-hand phase. And when you're reading the Gospels, that's where you are. It was the at-hand phase of the kingdom. And they were going to have to go through the balance of the time schedule, the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble. John the Baptist himself said, O generation of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? How did you flee from that wrath to come? You repented, believing the kingdom of heaven was at hand. You separated yourself from the apostate nation and you joined the little flock by getting into John's water baptism. And then at the end of that tribulation period, Christ would physically return from the Father in heaven and bring the kingdom. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to do what? To return. So you know what the gospel of the kingdom was. Christ was preparing Israel to go through that tribulation period. I got a question for you. Where in all of this that we've just been reading, where is the dispensation of grace? Where, where are you in all this that we're reading? You know what? The Apostle Paul says that this information was a mystery. N not in the sense of mysterious, cloudy, foggy. But it was not known. It was not, had not been disclosed. It was hidden information. That's why on the little chart that we have up here, it's hidden until God discloses it. And he discloses it first to and then through the Apostle Paul for this dispensation of grace. In this dispensation of God's grace, what is the gospel? You know... Look over to 1 Corinthians 15. Look over to 1 Corinthians 15. And get Romans 3. Um, go to Romans 3 and go to 1 Corinthians 15. We asked the question already, is the kingdom of heaven at hand today? 
Okay, it's not at hand today. So, would it make any sense to go out preaching the gospel of the kingdom today? That's not the gospel today. It's not what's going on today. It's a completely wrong use of the phrase, gospel of the kingdom. Either of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. It is, that's the wrong phrase to use. You do find the phrase gospel of God referencing, referenced by both programs. Because the gospel of God is like overall perspective. But the gospel of the grace of God is different in content than the gospel of the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 15, it says this. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 says this. Moreover, brethren, I declared unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. By the way, you, I'm going to slow down a little bit here because tell you, I'll come back to it. I'll come back. Look at verse 2. Which also, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also, what? Notice verse 3. He doesn't say, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also finally figure out from Isaiah 53 and Psalms 22 and Psalm 16. He doesn't say it that way. Uh, 15 verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Everybody got that? Yes. Watch how he says it. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also what? What's significant about the fact that he says, I received? That's part of the new revelation committed to his trust. He got this by direct revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't get this from going back and reading Isaiah. He'd read Isaiah probably thousands of times as a Pharisee. He read Psalms. But he doesn't appeal to Psalms or Isaiah when he indicates, I received it. How that Christ died for our sins according to what? Christ's death on the cross for our sins is not inconsistent with the Scriptures. It's according to the Scriptures. It's in line with them. Because it turns out that indeed Isaiah 53 does have the Messiah dying for sins. Though, of course, in Isaiah 53, he's dying for Israel's sins. He dies for the sins of many, Isaiah 53 says. Christ himself said that in Matthew. He shed his blood for many. He says here and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Can you preach the gospel of the grace of God and not mention Christ died for your sins according to scriptures? Be buried and raised again the third day? Listen, that is the gospel today. That is the heart of the gospel. Look over to Romans 3. And hold your place there in 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to come back to it. We're going to come back because there's something else I wanted to point out there. Look over to Romans 3. Look at Romans 3, verse 9. What then, are we better than they? Who's the we and who's the they? Do you know? Jews and Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles. No one know us, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. That's what Paul did in Romans chapter 1, 2, and up to this point, chapter number 3. He just got through proving. Chapter number 1, he proves the Gentiles guilty. Chapter number 2, in the first part of chapter 3, now here's the Jews guilty. So he proves all the world guilty. See the, the flow here? Jump down to verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. How is it that if the law was given to Israel and not the Gentiles, how then can the law bring the whole world guilty? Before God, the whole world, including the Gentiles. How can it do that? 
The law pointed out sin. The, the, the Gentiles didn't need the law in order for sin to already be functioning in them. It says, verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of what? It's the knowledge of sin. Think about our parallel with 1 Corinthians 3. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Paul said that Christ's death for us Gentiles was to be testified in due time, part of his ministry. Did the Gentiles need the death of Christ for their sins? Did, did the Gentiles need the death of Christ as for the forgiveness of their sins? Did Israel need the death of Christ for the forgiveness of sins? Yes, but this passage makes it clear that both Gentiles and Israel were sinners, so Christ had to die for their sins. I'm making the parallel with 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is, oh, don't you love this, by faith of Jesus Christ. That's His faith. Unto all. So it's available for everyone. But it's upon all them that what? For there is no difference. See, we're all in the same boat as it were. Jew and Gentile alike condemned by sin and the law. The righteousness of God has become available... Because of whose faith? That's right, Christ's faith. The righteousness of God is available for who? Anyone and everyone. The righteousness of God will be put to the account of who? Those that believe. When you trust in fact, keep reading. Look what it says. 23, for all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified, that means to be declared righteous. What's the next word there? Look at 324. Being justified, what's the next word? What's that third word? What is that word? Look at that. What's that word mean? That's a grace word. What's that word mean? Without cost. What else does it mean? It means anyone can get it. What else does it mean? Unconditional. Therefore, what else does it mean? It's without. It's unlimited. It's without cost. Say it right there. No it is without cost. It is without obligation. You understand what that means? We mentioned last week, and we often mention the fact that once you are in Christ, it, you can't ever get out of Christ. You didn't put yourself in Him. You can't take yourself out of Him. Justification is without cost and without commitment on your part. He's the one that committed his all. Justification is not a bargain. It's not a contract. It's not an agreement. It's not a dedication. It's not a promise that you make. It's not some kind of deal you got to uphold. You are justified freely by His grace. Not by your promise, your commitment, your dedication, your keeping, your promising to uphold some certain standard. It's by His grace. Amen. Through the redemption. Redemption is the payment of a price to set you free. And where is that redemption? It's in Christ Jesus. Redemption is in a person. It's not in religion. It's not in deeds. It's not in a commitment. It's not in keeping the law. It's not an obligation. Redemption is in a living person. 
And when you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, where did you get put? Whether you liked it or not, where did you get put? You got put into Christ. His death, burial, and his resurrection. I want you to go to Romans 6, and we're going to have to wrap it up here. Though we're not near done with all this, right? Well, by the way, when can you ever be near done preaching the gospel of the grace of God? Does it ever get old? To be focused on him, to talk about him, to think about him. He's the Savior. He's the Lord. He's our hope. He's our life. He's our righteousness. He's our sanctification. He's our redemption. That according as it is written, let him that glorieth glory. Where? In the Lord. Look at verse Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Well, how come? What does that verse say? Well, what does that have to do with it? See, when, when that verse says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace, why does the one explain the other? Okay, that's true. That, that's a true statement. We're free from sin. But, but how come me being the believer, being not under law, but under grace, is the guarantee that sin will not have dominion over you? Because what? You're in Christ, therefore. What else? You can't be tried where there is no law. What is the nature of the relationship that we are now in? Are we under a, nat- a relationship of the law? Or under a relationship of grace? We're in a relationship of unconditional love, unmerited favor, unrecompensed, meaning you can't pay it back and God didn't expect you, unrecompensed kindness. The reason that sin, because we do still sin, every sin you sin is a willful sin. Understand that? We do, we do still sin. But the reason that sin can never determine your destiny is because you're not in a relationship based upon your performance. Under the law, you fail, then sin will determine your destiny. But if you're in a relationship where God justified you freely, without cost, without obligation, in a relationship where it's His grace, and now you've got the redemption in Christ Jesus, it's in Him. You're in Him. That's the relationship that you're in now. So sin can never determine your destiny. Because you're no longer in a relationship where your destiny is based upon sinning. You're in a relationship in Christ Jesus. That's wonderful news. Look look in the same chapter. Look at verse 9. 6 9. He says, Romans 6 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth, what's it say there? No more. Death has no more dominion over him. Well, how come? How come death can never get Jesus Christ again? Never, 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 never. Well, look at the next verse. For in that he died, he died unto sin. How many times did it take? It only took once. Listen, if you get into the ring with the guy and you beat him with the first punch and he's down and everything, you win. You're not going to be contested again next year or next year and so forth. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Do you know anyone else in Romans 6 that also died and is alive unto God? Who? You. Question. You see the word in verse 9, the word dominion, verse 9, yes? Do you see the word dominion in verse 14? 
Do you see that? You want to know why, look at verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. You want to know why sin can no longer and will never have dominion over you? It's for the exact same reason that dominion will no longer and can never have dominion over Jesus Christ. It's the exact same reason. That's his logic here. And why won't it have dominion over Christ? Because he died unto sin once the price was fully paid. And when you were baptized into the death of Christ, guess who else therefore died? You already died the death that matters. And nothing can change that. In order for your identity in Christ to be revoked... For any reason, because any reason it could be would have to be some sin, but didn't you already die for that sin? In order for your identity in Christ to be revoked, what would have to happen to Christ? He'd have to die again. Isn't that something? You know, friends, what does this bring about in your heart? What does this produce? Joy. Joy. What do you say? Joy, someone said peace, love, love thanksgiving, rest, rest real hope. Tr- genuine hope, real faith. Real faith. And, and doesn't this take the eyes off of ourselves? Because which one of us here as believers would not admit that, you know, we still struggle with some things? We all rec- Listen, when we get our eyes on ourselves, we recognize our shortcomings, our failures, this and that. But just these last several minutes, who we've been talking about, who we've been thinking about, who we've been focusing on, who you are in Christ. That's where to focus. The wonderful message about the gospel, the grace of God, it keeps seeking to shift the thinking of the, bel- of the lost person from self to Christ and then the saved person from self to Christ. Look at him. In whom? In him. In the beloved. Rejoice in him. Lord, go ahead. But isn't it so that it's not just the he doesn't have dominion over us and that's why we're not going to be punished for it. It doesn't have to control our life. Exactly. Amen. Yes, what Laurie said, verse 14, it's not only that sin is not going to determine our eternal destiny, But what Paul is going to go on to say from verse 15 to the rest of the chapter is, you know, we don't have to let it control our life anymore now. We can let it do that. By the way, as a believer, can you still sin? (laughs) See, salvation by grace doesn't mean that a believer can't sin. Neither does it mean that a believer won't sin. It means that God doesn't justify you because of sin, sinning, an increase of sinning, or even a reduction in sinning. Your justification has nothing to do with the amount, the quantity, the continuing or not continuing in your sin. Justification is by grace through faith being justified freely, not because we stopped sinning. Being justified freely, not because we made a promise to turn over a new leaf. Being justified freely, not because we made a, made a commitment. Justified freely, not because we invited Jesus into our heart. You're justified freely by His grace, not by what we do or fail to do. Start doing or stop doing. His grace through the redemption. Redemption is in a person It's in Christ Jesus. It's in Him. Our gracious God and Father, we we ask that as we continue to look at the clarity of the gospel of Your grace and to understand it in the background of the gospel of the kingdom, not in any way to misunderstand or misrepresent the gospel of the kingdom, But to fully understand both Gospels, that's our purpose and our intention to understand all these things. And as we continue to seek to grow in your grace, in your word, and especially in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope, our life, our all in all, that we might truly experience in our inner man 
the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, and that long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance, all the fruit of the Spirit, by seeing who you have made us to be in Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen. Amen.